One of my favorite things to build with the children are log cabins with Lincoln Longs. There's just something like therapeutic sitting with them and slowly building something from our uh, imagination. Of course, as a father, like I probably take that way too seriously. So every wall needs to be perfect. Every room needs a window. Every tower needs a cool bridge to the other tower. Every plastic shingle needs to be placed in the right color order. My log cabin has to be perfect. Whoa. Um, so when, when I, I, I put together this cabin, and to be honest, it's just a matter of time before one of my uh, kids gets angry over something silly and they just knock my house over. Um, I try really hard as a parent not to take that stuff personally. Um, but this morning, I, wa- I want to talk about a house that is temporary. A house built by Moses. A house that was meant for the, the glory of God to dwell. A house that was meant for us to look forward to the future. And so we will easily see the answer to the question, what did Moses build? But the better question that we need to answer with our time together is what did Jesus build and why does that matter for us? So let's pray and then uh, we'll go after it. Father, um, we just confess we are a distracted people. This morning, I, my mind is distracted. My mind is plenty of other places outside of your word. Things uh, from this past week, things to do today, things to think about for the week to come. Uh, Father, so I, I ask, we plead that you would remove these distractions for all of us, that we may be able to focus on the power and the authority of your word. God, be with us with us this morning. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. We're going to start in Exodus 40, the very last chapter of Exodus. You want to turn uh, in your Bible with me to Exodus 40. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out the ESV. If you have notes, all of the main scripture will be in your notes. Everything else should be up on the screen. This morning, we're going to finish the book of Exodus, and I've heard some of our staff here that say that they're ready to Exodus, Exodus. Okay, I didn't think that was funny, um, but that's what we're going to do during our time together. So last week, we, we looked at this encounter between God and Moses. We looked at four prayers for the faithful. So Lord, please, Lord, show me your ways. Lord, show me your presence with me. Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show yourself through me. In Exodus 40, we will continue to build off of that message. So Moses, he's setting up this tabernacle to have an experience with Yahweh, the Lord. It's this radical experience for the people that will point us forward to something even greater. So you can join with me. I'm going to be in Exodus 40. I'm going to start in verse um, 32. And we'll read together. Verse 32 says, And when they went into the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he erected the court uh, around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we picked up in verse 32 with the word they. They went into the tent of meeting. They includes Moses, Aaron, and then Aaron's sons. And as this group of men approached the altar, they watched as the Lord directed Moses. This was a typical interaction with the tabernacle. Moses had finished the work of the building, and it was now time to be used by the priest. But what we find in verse 34 is this supernatural event that takes place. So in this, in this event, in verse 34, this cloud began to cover the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was unable to even enter into the tent of meeting because of the glory of the Lord. Stop, like, just stop. Seriously, stop and think about that. This house that Moses worked so hard to build, 
he had listened to these very specific instructions from the Lord. He had hired all of the right people to get the job done. Moses finished the work, and then the next few verses, he wasn't even allowed to enter into the house. Why? Why in this moment do we see Moses banned from the tabernacle? Even we look at last week, Moses speaking face to face with the Lord as a friend, and now he can't even go into the building. See, God is making it very clear that this was his house. God was making it clear to Moses and to Aaron and to Aaron's sons and all of Israel that the tabernacle belonged to the Lord. So Moses might have finished the work, but the work wasn't his. It was the Lord's. The, Lord, the Lord's glory flooded into the tabernacle. It filled every room and it overwhelmed the people. This was his house. So this pattern, it just continues as the people trek to the promised land. But look at verse 36. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in it by night, and the sight of all of the house of Israel throughout all of their journey. So whenever the cloud settled on the tabernacle, Israel would stay put. Whenever the cloud was taken up, Israel would move towards the promised land. So there was a cloud on the tabernacle by day, fire on the tabernacle by night. And then in verse 38, you can read that this happened in the sight of all of the house of Israel. Imagine that experience in the wilderness. Israel was on a journey, a journey that filled them with doubt at times, anger at times, worry at times, fear at times. It's easy to feel Israel's journey because we feel it in our own journey, right? We, we often doubt that we're headed in the right direction and then our future will be okay. We are often angry when life doesn't work out the way that we thought it would. We're often worried or fearful of the outcomes that honestly we don't even have control over. It's easy to feel Israel's journey because we feel it in our own, but don't miss the point here in the text. Israel could look at the house of God, and Israel could look at the dwelling place and physically see the presence of the Lord. The cloud was there. The fire lit up the night sky when the darkness was all around them. The Lord would be with Israel on their journey. The Lord would be with Israel in their doubt and their anger and their worry and fear. The Lord would get them to the promised land. Not all of them, but enough of them. This tabernacle, this temporary house of God that Moses built became the visible presence of God among Israel. That's what Moses wanted all the way back in Exodus 33 from last week. This is 33, starting in verse 14. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to them, look, if your presence will not go with me, do, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known for, that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? So that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. The presence of Yahweh was with Israel. The tabernacle was completed. Moses finished the work. So what? Like you're not walking the promised land this morning, right? I'm going to the land of Canaan. You don't see any clouds or fire by night out of your bedroom window. You have bills to pay. You have children and grandchildren to raise. You have work to accomplish. You have relationships to manage. You have things to worry about for your family. You have a life to live with all the good things that come with life and all the bad things. Why does any of Exodus 40 matter to us in 2020? What does Moses building a temporary house of God mean for Christians? What does it mean for you as a believer in Christ this morning? 
Great question. Turn with me uh, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3 for that answer. It is impossible to teach Exodus without Hebrews or Hebrews without Exodus. So these things are so closely tied together. And Hebrews 3 will give us the answer that we need defined to that question. What did Jesus build? Why does it matter right now? Why does that matter for you? I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 3. I'll start in verse 1. This is what it says. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Now let's stop. Now to clarify, the phrase holy brothers is not just meant for the guys in the house. The writer of Hebrews, which is unidentified, is speaking to both men and women. And more than that, I love what he puts in the text. The men and women in Christ that share in verse 1 this heavenly calling. I love that. As an identity marker for the people of God, Christians are identified from a calling that is not of this world. We are not identified by our race or by our politics or by our opinions on the way this world should spin. We are identified by our heavenly calling. It throws our minds to the eternal Christ. Consider Jesus, which we'll see in this passage. So look at verse 2. who is faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses, who is also faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house, as much more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken to later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Here is the radical reality of Hebrews 3. Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses, he built a temporary house and became a servant in the house. But Jesus built an eternal house and became the son over the house. Meaning Moses built the tabernacle, but Jesus makes us the house of God and then fills us with his presence. So if you're a note taker, there's your main point this morning. The main point this morning is this. Jesus makes us the house of God and then fills us with his presence. Our main point that that echoes the message from last week, that's the powerful truth that we find in Hebrews 3. Believers in Christ become the tabernacle for God to dwell. Look at Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you. As believers in Christ, we become the house of God. We become the dwelling place not made by human hands. The house of God is not East River Park at 1207 Broad Street. The house of God are bodies of brothers and sisters in Christ that are in this country and around the world. So if you're a believer in Christ, God is dwelling within you right now. Can I be honest about that? I'm going to to anyway, so. I don't I don't usually feel like the dwelling place of God. When I look at myself in the mirror and see just increasing gray hair, starting on this side, this is working around, I don't feel like the dwelling place of God. When I get out of that old recliner and I get up, I'm back a little stiff for my age. I'm like, what is this about? I don't feel like the dwelling place of God. The truth is God dwells in spoiled and broken vessels. 
And God chose to create me, and God chose to dwell in this broken and sinful body. I don't have a perfect body, and I don't need any amens for that one, okay? I don't always eat right. I don't always sleep enough. I, don't, I, I struggle with sin in this body. I struggle with, with mental unrest in this body. And the God of the universe chose to dwell in this spoiled, broken vessel anyway. Listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18, 3, it says, So I went to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands. So he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Jesus chose to dwell in spoiled vessels, and Jesus is in the process of reworking us into a new vessel. Meaning, if you are broken and busted up this morning, that's okay. Because as believers in Christ, God is dwelling within you, and he is in the process of making you new. This whole series, the second half of Exodus, was entitled Sanctification, or Sanctified, in short, Sanctified. Sanctification is this process of being made holy. That is what Jesus does for us as believers. Jesus makes us the house of God, fills us with his presence, and makes us new. So you might look at yourself right now and see, the bro- and see brokenness, but Christ looks at you and sees something new. Jesus, builder of the house, son over the house, presence of the house, perfecter of the house. We are the house of God, and he fills us with his presence. But look at verse 6. It ends with a qualifier. It says, we are the house of God if. And that if, I'll be honest, it can be confusing. That if is usually tied to an expectation. So on Thursday night, I told my kids they can have a cupcake if they eat their dinner, which they did, and then they didn't like their cupcake. So, I don't know, parenting is frustrating. But I want to be clear, the if found in verse 6 is not an expectation that seals the promise, meaning we do not secure our own salvation but we do spend the rest of our lives focused on Christ who does. So the writer of Hebrew gives us two ifs in the text in verse 6. So if you're a note taker, here's the rest of it. We are the house of God if. We are the house of God if. Here's your first if. If we hold fast to the confidence we have in Christ. If we hold fast to the confidence we have in Christ. When I was a kid, my, my uncle, he tried to teach me to, to water ski. If you've ever been water skiing, you know how difficult it is just to get up, but definitely just to keep your grip. And so I finally got up on the water, and this boat, he just continues to speed up, and it's hold fast or eat water. For a kid, that's terrifying, but it's also fun. See, our, our confidence on holding fast to Christ isn't how tight we keep our grip. We are confident, confident because we hold tightly to Christ, and then he will hold tighter. Look at John 10, 27. It says, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them. And they will follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Christianity, look, Christianity is not hanging from a cliff and hoping that you can hold on. Christianity is holding tightly to Christ, who will not let you go. That's where our confidence comes from. No one is able to snatch you out of the Father's hand, not even you. And how often we need to be reminded of that as followers of Christ, the house of God, the dwelling place of God. We didn't create the house. Not made by human hands. You did not create the house. 
We didn't fill ourselves with God's presence. And we don't have the power to serve God in eviction notice. So look at Hebrews 10, 35 through 36. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. I've spent a lot of my life following Christ without that kind of confidence. I spent a lot of my life as a Christian in fear that I'm about to mess up what Christ has promised me. That God would just give up on this spoiled vessel and I'll find someone easier that's just a little easier to, to mold. That's not the promise of the gospel. That's not the promise of John 10 or Hebrews 3 or Hebrews 10 or the, the whole Bible. We are the house of God. God dwells in us. Keep following Jesus in your brokenness. Don't throw away your confidence. Keep your endurance. Do the will of God. God has promised believers an eternal reward greater than anything this world can offer. We have confidence because we hold fast to Christ and we know he will hold us tighter. I love this song. It's called, uh, He Will Hold Me Fast. Here's the lyrics. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. We are the house of God if we hold fast to the confidence that we have in Christ. Here's the second one. Here's the second if. If we are the house of God, if we boast in the hope that Christ finished the work. We boast in the hope that Christ finished the work. Don't miss what, what Hebrews is saying. Believers do not boast in anything they bring to the table, meaning we aren't prideful in how awesome we think we are as Christians. And I've been around Christians that um, are, are full of self-righteous pride. Anyone? Let's just, let's just take a survey. Anyone been around a Christian that you're like, ah, me and you, we're not going to get along, okay? Look good on the outside. They look and act like they've got this whole Christianity thing figured out. Self-righteous Christians, really just prideful modern Pharisees. And as much as I hate when Christians act that way, I, I quickly, I quickly act that same way too. As soon as my walk with Christ is on point and I've been reading the Bible and I've been praying those deep prayers and things seem to be clicking and doing the right thing, it's easy for me to be prideful and start judging others that aren't doing so well on their journey. Boasting in ourselves is our default position. It's what we naturally do. Boasting in Christ takes a supernatural intervention. So if anyone that's walked the face of this earth has reason to boast in their own works, it was the Apostle Paul. Knew and followed the law better than you and I. Like we struggle to tell co-workers about Jesus. This brother is preaching the gospel to those that want him dead. If anyone had reason to boast, it was Paul. And here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Galatians 6.14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So our boasting and our pride and our bragging is not of ourselves, but the powerful work of Christ. So if God has made you awesome at sports, people are starting to notice, point people to the work of Christ. If God, if God has made you awesome at your job, People at work are starting to notice. Don't walk around your workplace with arrogance. Point people to the work of Christ. If God has given you a gift 
in ministry and people are starting to notice, don't let your head grow bigger than the church doors. Point people to Christ. Our boasting is in the hope that Christ finished the work. It is not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And I'll just keep saying that to you until I die or you get rid of me, one of the two. It's not about you. That's, why, that's how churches fall apart. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. We boast in the hope that Christ finished the work. A few years ago, our home uh, needed some painting. It was, it was a hundred-year-old house showing its age, and so I had a contractor come out and give us some, some quotes on vinyl siding. And then I realized how much vinyl siding costs. Okay, a little too much. So I was like, okay, well, let's just paint it. We went to Sherwin-Williams, got several hundred dollars worth of paint. Project began. We had some uh, friends and family. We, they helped scrape the house. We power washed everything. It took forever just to prep this place. And every time I would drive home from work, I would pass by these other homes with beautiful siding. Their house was perfect. Their house had, had, had it all together. And I pulled into our driveway, and there's my ugly house, a work in progress. As we were able to paint, um, it started to come together, and, and my mom, she, she spent countless hours painting our, our front porch white. Things were starting to look great. Do you know what I was thinking? Our, our back porch needed refinished. Our garage roof needed replaced. Our fire pit needed reworked. Our driveway needed sealed. Like if you've ever owned a home, you know that there's always work to do. So let me encourage you this morning. Believers in Christ Jesus are the house of God, but the house is a work in progress. Sanctification doesn't mean that you've arrived at perfection. It just means you're moving forward. There will be times when you doubt God's goodness. There'll be times when you give in to sin, even though you know it's not worth it. There will be times when you struggle to trust God, even though he's proven faithful to you over and over. This house, it's not perfect, it's, but it's, it's a work in progress. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't be discouraged by the process. Moses, he only built a temporary house, but Jesus, he's building an eternal one. This world will chew up your confidence and leave you feeling helpless. Don't give in to that. Hold fast to the confidence that you have in Christ because he is making this spoiled vessel new. This world, man, I have seen this over and over. It, it's, this world's great into tricking you into thinking it's about you. Don't give in to that. Boast in the hope that we have in Christ. He finished the work. That's the awesome impact of the gospel. Christ is making you new. However, Christ has finished the work. We are the house of God if we hold fast to the confidence that we have in Christ. We are the house of God if we boast in the hope that Christ finished the work. Jesus is making us the house of God and he fills us with his presence. So let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the impact that it has on my own life. God, I struggle with this. Father, you, you know you know me better than any person in this room. You know my own struggles with confidence. God, and you know my own struggle with, with making everything about me. God, and so I'm thankful. I'm thankful that your son Jesus, he built an eternal house, building an eternal home, dwelling place of the Lord. So God, help us. Help us as a church. If we're baptized believers in Christ, we are the house of God. Help us to be confident in Christ and Christ alone. Help us to boast in the hope that you've already completed the work. 
we were a work in progress, but the work is finished. God, thank you for your church. I just pray for encouragement. I know there's people that are struggling right now with things that the church knows about, but there's also people in our church that are struggling deeply with maybe things no one knows about. So God, I just pray that they might uh, find comfort in, in talking with other brothers and sisters in Christ, but most importantly, that they might cling to the scriptures and find hope in your son, Jesus. So God, thank you for East River Park, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.